It's the Sports Take Lunch Break brought to you by Office Essentials, your hometown supplier of all the office products and furniture you need to grow your business. All right, I'm your host, Andrew Corns, and we are back with another episode. Joining me on the mic for a third consecutive week is the one and only Dan Sashanik. Dan, how are you today? Good, Andrew. How about you? I'm good. Uh, again, good to see you. You're about the only face I see six feet apart, of course, yes, uh, in the course yes. of a week other than my family. So it's nice to get out and, and see someone. As a, as a uh, self uh, uh introvert, I am losing it oh really i am losing it as one person who loves to stay away from people Uh uh-huh i am it's just bugging me it's starting to bug me now because i do need i do need the talks that we have every day or you know that kind of stuff that's the the kind of interaction that i that i've figured out i do need i can understand that yeah i'm I'm introverted as well and i wish i could get a little bit of introversion but with uh, a two-year-old and a newborn and a wife it's just, it's chaos. Love the pictures, seven. though. Oh. you got to keep those coming. I will do. Yeah. All right. Well, this is our third episode under this strict quarantine and the social distancing. We don't have a ton of new sports to talk about. Obviously, nothing's being played. So we're going to spend the majority of our time going through a listener mailbag of questions. They've got a lot of, our, our listeners sent us a lot of good questions last week, and we've got some more this week. So we're just going to kind of randomize those and go through those, if that sounds good to you, Dan. Yeah, it makes us to see them. Before we get into the mailbag, though, i got a few topics I want to go over in a quick segment we were calling Love It or Hate It. Okay. okay, perfect. So I've I've taken a few notes. So, you know, we're now three weeks in. There's no sports. So I'm trying to, like, find other things to kind of fit that sports niche in my, yeah. you know, my, my watching section. So I've got some things that I've been loving and hating about the sports world. So if you'll indulge me for a minute and feel free to chime in yeah, anytime sure. you want. My first one is going to be a love it. So I don't know if you saw, but ESPN has a documentary series. It's a 10-part series on Michael Jordan. It's called The Last Dance. They've been teasing it for probably, I don't know, two months or so. And everyone's been really excited. You know, this this it's going to be the most in-depth documentary on Michael Jordan. And as somebody who loves Michael Jordan and the, the 90s Bulls, I just, I'm so excited for it. And originally it was supposed to come out in June. And then some rumors came out at the start of last week that they were going to move it up. And then they announced April 19th. So we're only a couple wow. weeks away. We're going to get the first, I think they're going to do... Two episodes a week for five weeks, I think is the plan. So it's okay. ten, 10 episodes, two episodes a week. So April 19th, you got Michael Jordan's Last Dance. I think it's got the opportunity to be the best sports documentary that's ever been made. If you, if you haven't seen the trailer, I recommend as soon as we get done with this, go see the trailer because it looks incredible. They've got you know Phil Jackson and Scottie Pippen and Steve Kerr and all the guys that played with them are doing interviews, lots of interviews from other people. He, I mean, he just transcends everything – that has to do with um, American sports. Yeah, and for everyone who's, you know, in this listening right now that's under, I don't know, what, 30, maybe 25, if you're unfamiliar with Michael Jordan and how – if you think LeBron James is the greatest player you've ever seen, I'm not going to argue with you. He's, he's an incredible player, but he's not Michael Jordan. Please go back and watch the Michael Jordan footage and definitely watch this documentary series because it's going to oh, be yeah. amazing. Yeah, if you need somewhere to start, start with the flu game. Um, or you could also start – you can start with one of the uh, the numerous uh, playoff games where uh, where Chicago was down by one with a second to go. I mean, how many times has that come up for him? And he just produces, and it's it, you're you you see that the Chicago Bulls are going to be passing the ball in, and you're like, oh, this game's over. You know, I think I'll switch. Right. You don't need to watch it because you know it's going to him, and you know he's. Bearing it. Well, what's funny is most athletes would probably give their life for one Michael Jordan moment. And he's oh. got, you know, dozens of moments. Like you said, the flu game. There's the double nickel game where he scored 55 right after uh, retiring from baseball. There's uh, the jazz crossover. The jazz crossover. Oh, did geez. he push Did he push Byron Russell or not? You know, you've got the, the shot he hit over, um, over Elo and the Cavaliers early in his career. You've got the, all the stuff in the dunk contest. Just moment after moment after moment. Yeah. So definitely, I'm, I'm I'm incredibly excited for April 19th. I know what I'm going to be watching that night. On the flip side, I'm going to go to one of uh, one of the things I'm hating right now. That is this weekend that we just had was supposed to be Liverpool versus Manchester City. Oh yeah, yeah. That would that that was it was set up to be the biggest game of the season. They're the two best teams in England. They've been one and two in the standings. Liverpool had a 20 plus point lead when the season stopped. Ooh, yeah. There was a good opportunity that that could have been the game that Liverpool won the title. And so it's it's really painful that, you know, 
I'd been like looking forward to that weekend for months oh, and yeah. then here it comes and I'm like, Oh my goodness. It's well, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and said that it would have been, they would have had the title before this week, Andrew. Uh, it's, it's highly likely, you know, uh, I'm going to say that I will say though, I was encouraged. I looked this morning and I don't know if you saw the news. It sounds like FIFA has put an indefinite hold on next season. They've basically told all the leagues around Europe and the world, we want priority to be finish the seasons and the competitions we have in place now. And one of the big one of the big holdups was a lot of the player contracts end June 30th. So a lot of guys on teams who are out of contract oh. on June 30th, they would have been free agents essentially. And then it was like, well, what do you do if you start if you play games in July? So what FIFA's done is they put also an indefinite hold on player contracts. So okay, nice. Um, so if you're on a team and your contract ends on June 30th, if the leagues go through July, August, September, however long they go. I think they're going to allow the players to stay on those teams. They're going to kind of reconfigure the transfer window for when seasons end. But yeah, good. It's very encouraging to me that all the leagues have sort of been directed by FIFA. Do what you can to finish the season. You know, yeah. you're you're seventy, you're eighty percent through the season. People have invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money in what's already come. Yeah, definitely. That should be the priority. Like, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I've had conversations and, and debates with people about this. I don't know why you'd prioritize next season, which at this point is just theoretical. Like, there's a, why would you, why would you, be so rigid towards making sure next season starts on day one of when it always does? When you know this is, these are very unusual circumstances. Yeah. Play what's already been played and finish that. You know, I'm talking about basketball, hockey, yeah, yeah. soccer across the board. You know, make finishing the season the priority. And yeah. then if you have to go to a shortened season next year, so be it. Yeah, but I, you know, I think I think that some of this can be alleviated with extended rosters. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, you extend a, you extend some of these rosters, uh, maybe maybe not in basketball, and uh, you know, but uh, some of these other sports, you extend the roster a little bit, and you got um, you got more you got more players on the pitch. You know, maybe give them one more sub for the rest of the season. You know, just just to kind of keep everybody healthy. You know, make it a uh, make it a short term kind of thing where you know these teams have another player on the bench and they have another another uh, you know set of set of uh, feet that they can go to or you know that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm on board with that 100%. Um, next next one on my love it list. ESPN started on Friday. It continued yesterday, and it's going to continue on the rest of this week. They're airing a players only NBA 2K20 tournament. So if you're not familiar with NBA oh, 2K20, okay. it's the video, it's the the basketball video game. Yeah. And what they did was they took 16 current NBA players and they have them playing each other and then, you know, ultimately one person's going to win and they're going to get money and donate it to their charity of choosing, which is really cool. Yeah, perfect. I'll admit, I I've been so craving anything sports related that I was compelled to like be their minute one on Friday. Oh, I'm sure. To make sure I, it was Kevin Durant against, oh my goodness, um, I'm blanking on the guy he went against. He actually ended up losing in the first round, Kevin Durant did. The players were seeded by their rating in the game. So Kevin Durant's like the highest rated player in the game, therefore he was the one seed. It doesn't necessarily mean he's the best video game player. No, the best video game player is going to be your ninth, tenth man on the bench. <laughs> exactly. And, and no actually, offense to the ninth, tenth man on the bench. Yeah, so of, of the eight games between the 16 players, uh, yesterday finished the first round. I think, I think the underdog – "Quote unquote underdog won, like, like six of eight or something. It's, like the majority of them. So yeah, uh, that sounds about right. But it was a lot of fun to watch. I, I there was banter between the players. That was kind of enjoyable to see. And and extending beyond that, just the esports has done a good job over the last three weeks of allowing certain sports to continue on. I'm specifically thinking about uh, F1, Formula One, and NASCAR. Yeah, oh yeah. Those sports lend themselves to guys playing a video game if you will have you seen the nascar setup so i watched it's, it's funny you mentioned that actually this morning it happened to be on like a replay of i don't even remember what race it was but it was i i i was glued to my seat i couldn't stop watching i actually found it i'm not i'm not dogging on nascar there's a lot of nascar fans and i'm not going to complain about nascar I, I don't have anything against it but i personally enjoyed watching the nascar drivers play the video game more than the actual nascar race because they got to interact with each yeah, other, yeah. and the, the commentators could, like, uh, they had Clint Boyer uh, mic'd up, and he ended up uh, getting in a wreck, like, on the 10th lap, and he was 
he was blaming the guy that came and bumped him, and then they showed the replay, and it turned out Boyer was actually the one that caused this big pileup. And it was just a really fun banter between the commentators and the drivers, and so I had a lot of fun watching that personally. Oh, I'm sure because, you know, they, they're so much professional and they have so much feel while they're in their car. So to put them out of their element and, yeah, they're sitting in it in what looks like a cockpit. Um, if you can picture a racing game in the, in your typical arcade mm -hmm. is, is basically what they're in. And, it's just, yeah, it's fun to see. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just enjoying that some of these sports are getting creative to keep content. The NBA, again, uh, I think is, is doing really cool stuff. So they're already arranging – a horse competition between quote unquote top players. They haven't named who the players are, but rumors are James Harden, LeBron James, Steph Curry, maybe some of these top guys. They each, all these guys have huge mansions. They all have home gyms and things like that. So, what they're going to do is do some sort of televised horse competition where they're all in their home gyms and they're doing trick shots from different angles and trying to compete with each other. And they're going to air that on ESPN. Again, I'm on board. I'll watch that all day. I just, I want my sports fix some way. And I think that'd be a lot of fun to watch. Okay, I'm, I'm asking for one thing out of that. Okay. Larry Bird. Ooh, I, the legends. That would Add be... Larry Bird to that, and I would love to watch it. Oh, that, or, or Jordan? Or Jordan. Any, yeah, anyone, anybody old. I just, I just think of Larry Bird because he is, if, if oh, once again, if you youngsters haven't been out there, he is the biggest trash talker that that has ever, ever played basketball. I'm I'm pretty much sure you're yes uh there was a documentary about a year ago or so i saw i think it was espn again espn doing great content with sports it was a documentary on larry bird and magic johnson and their oh, rivalry yeah. through college into yep. the pros and bird yes some of the clips that they pulled a bird talking trash on everybody he was on another level i would have loved to hear him uh, i've heard him in high school with his you know because talking to these these high school kids because i mean he talks to pros like they're like they're infants. Yeah. You know, I mean, and he shows them why he can do that. That's the thing. He backs up the trash yeah, talk. There's exactly. some guys who trash talk and then they have no business doing it. But Bird would do it. And he'd tell you what he was going to do and then he'd hit a shot in your face. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. And and he could he could rip on a he could rip on a guy on the other team and that other guy's teammate would laugh at him. <laughs> yes. You know, just be like, oh, no. Yeah. So, yeah, again, eSports, I'm having a blast with that. On the flip side, something I'm hating right now. Uh, the news broke last week that Wimbledon officially was canceled. Did yeah, you see that? I did see that. It's the first time in the history of Wimbledon when there's not war. So obviously Wimbledon wasn't played during the, the two world wars. Yeah. But it's the first time during peacetime that Wimbledon has been canceled in the 134 years or whatever it's been. I love Wimbledon. I mean, oh, yeah. I know we're both big tennis fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For me, Wimbledon's such a major component of my summer sports viewing. I, I just it, – it's such a cool event. Everyone gets into it. There's tons of drama and story. And for Wimbledon to, like, not exist is one of those things that's kind of depressing to think about. Like exactly. That's, it's a chunk of my summer that's going to so, be missing. So Wimbledon to me um, growing up was always uh, – always that final Sunday of the men's final was always the day that we left for vacation. Oh. And this is a vacation that we've gone on for 30-something uh, for – Odd years now. Um, shout out to Black River Lodge. Love you. But, you know, so we would watch Wimbledon just knowing that the final was coming, not to mention our vacation is coming. So, yeah, that's going to be a big loss. I, lo I loved watching Wimbledon. Yeah, between Wimbledon and the Olympics getting moved back, the summer has just gotten a little more depressing from yeah. a sports standpoint. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not, not enjoying that. On the flip side, though, I'm going to go to another thing I loved. All this free time in the evenings, usually I put the kids to bed. Flip on a hockey game, a basketball game, you name it. I've had to fill that void with something. So I've found myself watching sports movies that I hadn't ever gotten to or oh. sports whatever. I wanted to touch upon a couple of them that yes, I got please. to over the weekend. So I watched I, Tanya. Don't okay. know if you've seen it. Have no, you seen it? I have not. You know what it's about? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it, for those who don't know, I, Tanya is about figure skater Tanya Harding. Very infamous in the mid-90s when uh, – there was an attack on Nancy Kerrigan, who was her biggest rival, and Tanya didn't come out of it looking great. No, uh, so I was, I was, I also admit I was a huge figure skating fan as a child. It was something my mom and I connected to. Uh, we just loved watching figure skating together. It's, yeah, it's elegant to watch. Yeah, there and at and the in that mid '90s period, there were so many great skaters on the men's and women's side yeah. that were all compelling, and I just I loved watching it. So it was cool to see. 
this story on Tanya Harding, and I was interested to find out what perspective it would tell. And without spoiling anything for anyone who hasn't watched it, it uh, it takes footage of it basically take Margot Robbie plays Tanya Harding Tanya, does yeah. a fantastic job by the way, uh, and it's basically like her present day along with the gentleman who was her husband at the time, who was also involved in the Gugliotti or something like that. Uh, Gulali? Gulali. Gulali. Yes, he had one of those really goofy last yeah. names. Uh, Galuli. 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 Galuli right. Yes. Uh, so it's both of them in the present day talking to a camera, telling their side of the story. And during the movie, there are conflicting, they have, today they have conflicting stories about what happened in the 90s. Well, yeah. And the movie doesn't shy away from playing with the idea that not, what you're seeing isn't necessarily the whole truth. It's one person's side of the truth. So That's you, a good way of doing it. You kind of have to watch the movie and go, I'm watching what somebody's telling me. It's not necessarily a hundred percent accurate, but that's okay. Like it's a, it's a really interesting way they've done the movie. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. By the end, I was, uh, I was more, I think I was more sympathetic to Tanya Harding, the character <laughs> by the end of it. Uh, she got a, she got kind of a broad deal by a lot of the figure skating community in the nineties because she was like an outcast. You know, she came from, you know, a poorer family. She didn't fit the bill of what team USA wanted a figure skater to look like or sound like <laughs> or act like or whatever. Oh, that, that doesn't, uh, yeah. I mean, that just kind of uh, USA Olympics. Yeah. Kind of yeah. roll my eyes to that whole. I didn't know she was the first woman. Maybe I forgot. She was the first U S women woman to land the triple axel. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so I, I didn't know that. And again, that was just a, a point in the movie where she's like, I'm clearly the best female skater the U.S. has. I'm landing this move that nobody else can do. I still can't make the, the Olympic team. So she was all this resentment was building up to a boiling point and then the Nancy Kerrigan situation. The <laughs> other thing I watched actually this morning, I was up very early with my newborn. It was a deep cut on Netflix. So A deep cut it's, on Netflix? Yeah, it's not something you're going to find when you're just scrolling – you know, they, the way they run the algorithm, they're putting all the stuff they want you to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was really hidden in in a comedy section. I don't know if you're familiar with the Lonely Island crew. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, Andy Samberg and his guys who – Who uh, did you watch, Hot Rod? I didn't watch Hot oh, Rod. Okay. Hot Rod's a great movie. I love <laughs> Hot Rod. I watched Lonely Island Presents the Unauthorized Bash Brothers Story. Oh, okay. Are you familiar with this? I th yeah, I have. Yeah, it talks about Conseco and, and Maguire, right? It's, yes, it's like a 30-minute music video. Uh, I think the, the the opening scroll said it was a visual poem, which is kind of a hilarious way to describe it. But, yeah, it was basically like a 30-minute musical number of I, them rapping through the Bash Brothers story. I have, I have seen it, but it's been so long that I couldn't. Oh, my goodness. Uh, because it's so fresh in my brain, I, I'm still laughing at it. If you if you enjoy if you enjoy baseball, if you enjoy Mark McGuire for all the St. Louis people listening, if you enjoy the the story of the Bash Brothers, especially if you just enjoy comedy and what Andy Samberg does, you have to watch this. It is thirty minutes well worth your time. <laughs> I mean, it was hysterical. Well, speaking of that, then have you seen the uh, have you seen the Seven Days of God? I can't think of what the actual name is, but it's like Seven Days of Wimbledon. Um, Andy Sandberg. No, uh, I remember seeing the trailer. May, maybe it's not. Maybe they don't announce Wimbledon in, in the name, but um, but uh, basically, uh, Sandberg plays an Andre Agassi type player. Okay, and uh, and this game goes on for seven days. You just you have to watch it because it's just so. You know, there's 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 a time where they just they don't play for a day because they don't feel like it, or something like that. It's just who's like, his counterpart? Oh, I can't think of it. Um, I think it's the only. I think it's the other, the other lonely guy. island guy. But I can't. Yeah. I can't think of it right now. But it's it's another one of those where you just roll your eyes. You're like, how did these guys think of this? Stuff? I'm gonna have to look for that one. Yeah, that's another one to look for. Okay. And uh, speaking of Netflix, I did finish Tiger King. You did. Yes. And uh, thoughts. Um. Well, uh, if 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 I had to give my real thoughts, you'd have to bleep me because these guys are bad crazy yes they are they are so crazy i mean there's not there's not a there's not a normal one in the bunch there's not one normal person that they interview the most normal person is missing half of an arm probably oh yeah uh saf yes. yeah like she's she's, the most well, she, she's not normal either though. i know yeah. that's the thing yeah, yeah. 
Oh, geez. So uh, I don't know if you saw breaking news last night. Uh, Jeff, one of the characters in Tiger King, announced that there's a new episode coming out this week. Really? Yeah, it's some sort of follow-up episode he aired. Uh, he was part of filming it last week. I don't know the details of it. I don't know when Netflix is going to drop it. I don't know. Huh. But at some point this week, if you're one of those millions of people that are watching Tiger King, and I'm one of them, keep your eyes on Netflix because some random episode is going to drop. And oh, geez. It could be anything given what's happening on this show. Uh, they're, they're all just crazy they're just they're all nuts i mean every single one of them that carol baskins i mean if uh, where is don please tell us where don is <laughs> just let us know I, you know where he is i know it because you you look at her her nature the way she answers these question um either she stopped caring for this guy 10 years before he died or she never cared for this guy i think uh the Whatever county she's in down in Florida, they reopened the case. Yeah, the last Hillsborough week. County. Yeah. yeah, so that's really compelling. I'm sure that will probably be part of this episode that they're going to have this sure. week. Uh, Greg, who's one of our one of our STL break guys, he also got on the Tiger King bandwagon last week. I don't <laughs> remember if he told me how he, how he where he left off and what his final thoughts were, but I know he was jumping on it. There's no way I could binge watch that all in one time though, because that was so much to process. Yeah, I, I, we did like we did the first two episodes one night which I think was good for me because yeah. the cliffhanger at the end of the second episode is where you're like, okay, this is going to go real crazy real quick. And then we would watch like an episode a day. Yeah, so, there's seven episodes. I did two, three, two. Okay. I think is how I did it. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. That way it gives you time to like think through all the craziness because it's just jam-packed with wild stuff uh, from moment to moment. Exactly. Okay, my next hate it is going to be – UFC 249. I've been complaining about the UFC for a couple weeks now. This is going to be the third week in a row. Dana White is so compelled. So UFC 249 is supposed to take place in a couple weeks. The original card was going to be Tony Ferguson versus Habib Nurmagomedov for the 155-pound title. Habib is the champ. Tony Ferguson is a guy who has been the number one contender for many years. This fight's been in the works for five years. They've had it on and off multiple times. Guys getting injured right before the fight. So it felt like Dana White was going to do everything in his power to make sure this fight happened. Yeah. And uh, I think it was Friday or Saturday, Habib, who's in Russia, I was saying a couple weeks ago, yeah, I was like, how is he going to get to wherever they're going to have this fight? Well, it turns out Habib said... He's stuck, right? He's stuck, yeah. He's, yeah. He can't go anywhere. You know, what's he going to do about it? So he said he's not part of this card. So as of now, this fight's supposed to take place in two weekends. It's not. There's no venue. Uh, one of the, the champion, the 155-pound champion, the guy everyone wants to see fight, isn't going to be on the card. So reportedly this morning, ESPN announced that Dana White's going to announce the new card today at some point. So there's going to be some sort of new card, and he's going to officially announce the venue. The rumors I saw swirling this morning were, so almost every state athletic commission has taken away the fighter's license. They don't want people yeah, fighting. no. Understandably. I guess on Indian reservations – they're somehow outside of the law to where they don't have to – you don't have to have a, a sanctioned license to fight on an Indian reservation. <laughs> so the rumors are that Dana's going to fight some, find some Indian reservation somewhere and put on something of a fight. Well, the only plus to that would be the amount of money that the Indian reservation would pull in for that. Other than that, yes. I think they should cancel this. Yes. I, I don't see why they keep this up, Dana. Dana's just an idiot. And, and you can come here to St. Louis, Missouri and uh, come to my face, and I will still tell you you are an idiot for trying to put this fight on. It makes no sense. I mean, uh, he's clearly just in it for the money. Exactly. That's but what it looks like. My question is, and I think we touched upon this last week, a big component to UFC fights is people going to bars or getting together in parties at their house and splitting the, the huge astronomical pay-per-view yeah. fees. I can't see millions of people forking out $70, $80 on a UFC fight in the middle of this pandemic when money's tight for everybody, people are without jobs. I just don't see anything good that can come out of, unless he's going to put on this fight for free, which he's not going to do. No way. And, you know, get people to watch something because people will watch it in that case. I just don't see that any, for. there's no reason to have this fight. There's no reason to charge, try to charge people $70, $80 to pay for this fight. And at the end of the day, the match that everyone wants to see that's a mixed martial arts fan is Habib, and Tony Ferguson, and I can easily wait until August, September, November. You know, I've been 
sitting here waiting for this match for five years. All I want to do is see these guys fight. Just don't try to like throw another opponent at Tony Ferguson. You run the risk of him losing. It just doesn't make yeah. sense. It doesn't make sense. And I feel like Dana's just like, hell or high water, I'm going to have this fight. And I don't understand it. And it's it's gotten to the point where as much as I love mixed martial arts as a sport, I don't know if I can justifiably ever pay for a pay-per-view fight again as long as Dana White's associated with the UFC because my disdain for him is so bad at this point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just 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 give it up. I mean, this whole country's in lockdown. You know, jump on board. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, my last love it, and then we'll get to the mailbag questions. Big news, if you're in the basketball community, the Hall of Fame officially got announced. Everyone knew who the three Hall of Famers were going to be, but it's cool to kind of see it in writing now. So the class of 2019 Hall of Fame, Kevin Garnett, lock first ballot, no doubt. Oh, yeah. Tim Duncan, again, lock first yeah, ballot. have to. And the person that everyone was really excited to see, he's going to be Muggsy putting. Muggsy Bogues. <laughs> no, not Muggsy. Damn. I don't know if Muggsy's ever going to get in. That's a good question. Uh, it's going to be a posthumous uh, inclusion, but that would be Kobe Bean Bryant. So, oh yeah, uh, it was when when the Kobe when Kobe died a few months ago. God, it feels like yeah. it's been a lifetime ago at this point with all the stuff going on. But, oh, I know, uh, I know. You know, I think one of the things that people were really sad about when Kobe passed was he was going to get inducted into the Hall of Fame this year. It was going to be an incredible ceremony. You knew he was going to give a speech that would be an all timer. Uh, oh yeah, this class Garnett, Duncan, Kobe. I'll put that class against any class that's ever come in the Hall of Fame. Those three guys are like locks amongst the greatest players that have ever played the game, especially Duncan and Kobe. Oh, who, easily, who are, yeah. who are like top five kind of players. So it's really sad that Kobe's not going to be able to be there to be a part of it, but it's amazing if you're a basketball fan to get to see Duncan, Garnett, and Kobe all go into the Hall of Fame. So yeah, that would be nice. I was really excited to see that. All right, we're going to head over to our listener mailbag of questions, but here's a quick message from Office Essentials. Hey everyone, Andrew from the STL Break. I just wanted to remind you that Office Essentials sells everything you need for your HP printers. As a gold certified partner, we have qualified specialists able to direct you to the perfect fit for any office environment. By the way, did you know we also sell copiers? We sure do. Is your office out of date? Is your furniture from the 20th century? With dedicated furniture designer specialists, Office Essentials can help transform your office into the newest trending designs. With collaborative spaces to standing workstations, let Office Essentials show you what we have. All right, we're back, everybody. So we had so much fun last week answering your listener mailbag questions that we're going to jump in and do some more. We've got a ton of great questions that people sent in to us. If you're listening, please continue to send them to us. Go ahead and put them in reviews on Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening, and we'll uh, we'll get to those questions or follow us on the STL Break Twitter page. Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Would you like to jump in and ask the first question? Yes, I will. This is, right. is going to be a good one. Okay, let's see here. Oh, okay, since we were just talking about the NBA. Okay. Is the NBA draft lottery rigged? I'm going to jump in right away and say please. yes. Yes, it is rigged. Okay. Any particular reason you think it's rigged? Uh, just it's always suspicious and when everything's suspicious every year you have to think something's up and uh, you know for every for every league that is you know so so good and so proper there's always some craziness going on so i think it is rigged i do too i'm 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 always for a good conspiracy theory give me one let me absorb it there's no malice in a conspiracy theory about the NBA draft being rigged. You know, it's all just kind of fun. Here's a few. So if you're not familiar with the NBA draft lottery and why people, there's a lot of people that think it's rigged. You and I are in that category. It dates all the way back to 1985. So in 1985, the New York Knicks had the number one overall draft pick. The league was desperate to get the Knicks back as one of the premier franchises because yeah, obviously yeah, New York's yeah. a big market. The guy coming out of the draft that year was from Georgetown, Patrick Ewing. Everyone knew he was the guy. He was going to be the number one pick. Well, at that time, when they did the draft lottery, it was it was noticed that there was a bent corner of an envelope that happened to be the New York Knicks envelope. So that's the origin of the, is the draft lottery rigged, this bent envelope back in 1985. Ultimately, Patrick Ewing went to the Knicks. He never delivered a championship, but he was a huge reason why the New Yorks had a, the Knicks had a resurgence in that period. But there's too many... There's too many odd coincidences year after year after yeah, year. Exactly. Here's, here's a few of them that come to mind. So you've got 
LeBron James, he ends up in his hometown of Cleveland. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Derek Rose ends up in his hometown, Chicago. The year after LeBron goes to Miami, who gets the number one overall pick? Cleveland. Kind of a makeup deal for them, you know, losing a pick. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the other one that's really interesting, Chris Paul several years ago was going to get traded to the Los Angeles Lakers. At the time, Chris Paul was playing for New Orleans. They were the Hornets. The league actually owned the team. They didn't have an ownership group. The league vetoed the trade of Chris Paul to the Lakers. It's really nefarious stuff. As a Lakers fan, I've always been really bitter about it. That next year, New Orleans happens to get the number one overall draft pick. <laughs> when the league owns the team, okay, I rest my case. So, yes, draft lottery rigged, rigged. 100%. I don't know if it still is today, but I think it has been many it's times always, over the It's years. rigged. I, I don't trust that one. I don't trust the Champions League one. I don't. There's, there's, oh, yeah. there's a few of them out there that I don't trust at all just yes. because of this kind of stuff. And, yep. and not to mention that. I've put on a few of my own little tournaments at you know at vacation and stuff and yeah we rigged those. Oh yeah, there's always an element of of stacking the deck for sure. Oh yeah. All right, Dan, I got one for you. You ready? Okay. The question that we got sent in is: Has mixed martial arts killed boxing? Yes or no? No. No. Okay. No. I'm going to go with no because it is not as much as they are the same. They are totally different. I mean, in, in boxing, you have two guys squaring off, you know, punching each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, basically, that's that's it. You got to punch and, you know, and you can maybe uh, come in and, you know, throw a different kind of punch. But with mixed martial arts, you have everything. You have grappling. You have, um, you have uh, kickboxing. You have boxing, um, wrestling. There's so many different elements to it um, that, yeah, I, I – I really don't think it has killed boxing. Um, you know, I just think once again that I, I've I always thought that mixed martial arts would be a trend that kind of cycled back around and would kind of disappear eventually. And mm. I think that's what's going to happen is that is that some of these, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get sick of, you know, what are they on UFC two hundred two thousand nine hundred seven. Right. You know, well, why are we going to start, you know, why are we going to keep caring about this stuff if, you know, if there's a fight every two weeks and, and we, you know, and yeah. So I, I like boxing because it's two guys squaring off. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan of both sports, to be honest. And I don't know if I can definitively, definitively say yes or no. I think mixed martial arts has certainly had an impact on boxing. And by that, and it's not the only reason boxing Boxing is clearly diminished from what it was in the 70s or the 80s. Obviously, Muhammad Ali like brought boxing to another level that it will never reach again. There's no there's no way boxing's ever going to reach the peak of the 50s, the well, 60s, I think, and I 70s. Think it's numbers, if you don't mind me jumping yeah. in here. I think it's I think it's the numbers. Back in the day, you had Muhammad Ali and you know, and Joe Frazier and you're like looking down the list and you're like, "Okay, who else we have here?" You know, because yeah, there's there was a ton of boxers still at the mm -hmm. same time, but the elite that were known is is so much different nowadays because there is you know there's 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 probably something on the internet that that lists the top fifty boxers in every weight class. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of you know that might diminish it a little bit, but I think at the same time you know it, there's no way that makes martial arts is what is what killed boxing. Yeah, the, the only way mixed martial arts has had a real impact on boxing to me is there are probably a pretty significant number of mixed martial artists who, if that sport didn't exist, would end up as boxers. Oh, yeah. And so there are probably several amazing athletes. I'm thinking like John Jones is just a, a physical specimen, or Conor McGregor, who's obviously shown a prowess in, in the boxing aspect of things. If mixed martial arts wasn't a source – of income for them or an opportunity to you know to make money they would have probably gravitated towards boxing so i think i think mixed martial arts has sort of like lessened the pool of talented boxers but all you have to do really is look at this last you know a couple of months ago when tyson fury and deontay wilder had their fight these are two guys who really to a large number of people a year ago weren't household names no i but the thing that boxing does that mixed martial arts will probably never do in, in all fairness is a top-end boxing fight, for instance, Wilder and, and Fury 2, 
it reaches a level, a magnitude globally that is unparalleled to almost anything. I mean, people get so wrapped up in a in a high end boxing fight. It happened with um, it happened with Mayweather and um, and Pacquiao. You know, two guys that people were so invested in. It happened with all you know all the Tyson fights, Tyson and, and Holyfield. There's just something about a, a big, big boxing fight yeah. that mixed martial arts can't compare to. So I, I agree. I don't think boxing is ever going to go away, but I think I think it's diminished a little bit because of some of those great potential boxers who found their way into mixed martial arts. So I, th- I think it's it's a complicated answer. It's kind of a yes and a no, but yeah, I, I don't so. think they they certainly haven't killed them. You know, no, boxing is no. still doing just fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, Dan, what do you got for me? All right, let me uh, get this one going here. Ooh. I don't know what sport we're talking to here, mm, but uh, okay. could the best college team ever beat the worst pro teams? Well, let's, I mean, let's just kind of run the gamut of sports, really. Let's okay. start with baseball. Okay. No. <laughs> no. Not a chance. Um, I just think baseball players, there's there's too few good baseball players that come out of any given college in a year yeah. that I ultimately think if, if a college team had to go up against like Justin Verlander or Max Scherzer, they're not going to get enough opportunities to get runs. And on the flip side, I think even most most ace college pitchers are probably going to get lit up by a, a pro team more than not. So I'm going to say no on that one. Hockey, no, not there's no way a uh, there's no way a college hockey team is going to compete against top end NHL teams. The one again basketball. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, keep, keep going. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to say no on basketball. Basketball might be a little close because there's only five guys, you know, starting five. Yeah. There's more of a chance that, you know, a team like, a, you know, Kentucky or Duke or somebody has a really good class that year and they go against uh, – I'm trying to think who the worst team in basketball is right now. There's a few of them. You know, the, the Warriors obviously this year with a bunch of injuries, but, you know, like a, a Sacramento Kings or somebody. I still think – I still think it's hard. I, I wouldn't yeah, yeah. I wouldn't anticipate a college team – Maybe football, maybe football. That's that's the one I would maybe give a chance for a college team. And I'm thinking about like the Alabama teams that Nick Saban builds. Those teams are behemoths. Usually they get I don't know six or eight pro players out of a, a given yeah. team. Oh, yeah. There's so much flukiness that can happen in a football game that I don't think happens in hockey, baseball, basketball. That I think if certain circumstances went in favor of a college team, the college team has a shot to beat the worst NFL team, but probably not likely. So I'm going to say basically no across the board. What about you? You look like you're maybe going to disagree with me. Well, you know, there's a few a few I'd like to uh, actually, you know, kind of readjust. Um, are we talking, you know, we're talking pro teams. Are we talking about their minor leagues? No. Are you talking about all of the strictly? Okay. I think we're talking main, you know, Stri- NHL, NBA. St- okay. Then um, I'm going to start with NBA. Okay. I definitely think that there's a college team out there that would beat the worst um, NBA team, mm. and and like you said, um, you know it it would probably be one out of ten times that they would finally beat them. But um, you know, I I definitely think that if you find the right college team, you know, I'm talking like Duke, Michigan State, you know, one of those one of those elite ones. Um, they they might have a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, baseball, uh, baseball is you know I will have I, I have a little more faith in college baseball teams in this too because you could find a pitcher that is just pitching out of his mind. True, um, and you know, and then at the same time, you know, you think about these. It, it all depends on how this pro team comes into this game. You know, if a pro team just comes in thinking, you know, lackluster and we're going to, you know, we're just going to throw anybody and not care, you know, once again, I think I think a college a team could, you know, jump up and bite somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see here. Where, am I, where else am I going? You got and hockey. I, got hockey. Hockey. Hockey's one of those things where very, very doubtful, like you said, because the jump between the college game and the pro game is – it's not as it's not as wide as we think it is, but it's wide enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, you could get uh, you can get Boston College, Boston University, and uh, some of these teams, and they could probably put up a good game against, you know, Florida Panthers or you know a team like that. That is sitting very bad for it for a year, 
And at that point, all you need is a hot goalie. And yeah. If you had a hot goalie, you know, we could, you could potentially, you know, you could potentially do it. Look at, um, look at what Kirkwood uh, did with Mid States this year. They had a hot goalie, and they ended up a uh, third or fourth, something like that. Hmm. Um, and they they had no chance to be anywhere near that except for their goalie. You know, as you're talking about it, there is one collegiate program or sport where I maybe think there's an opportunity. I'm looking at UConn women or even like Baylor oh, women this year yeah. are an incredible team. There Gino's Gino at UConn has put enough good teams together. Yeah. It would not surprise me if a dominant UConn women's basketball team beats the worst WNBA team. I don't know who that is, but I just no, think yeah. there, there's a chemistry exactly. to a UConn or you know some of these teams maybe yeah. they got a shot. You know, and if we if you know keep, keep going back to this, um, you know, if we don't think there's a shot, then go look at the go look at the miracle. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, once again, you got college kids um, from basically three or four different colleges. I mean, and most of them were um, University of Minnesota or the uh, they were Boston was it Boston College, I think Boston University. Um, one of those, but you know, it was just you know they beat the hell out of a, a Russian team that have been been together mm -hmm. for ten, fifteen years. You know? I think this is perfect fodder for a poll question. So we're gonna throw this up on our Twitter page later today. Cause yeah, I definitely... throw it up and uh, make sure that uh, they comment which uh, which team uh, they think would you know could have potential to do it. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I appreciate that one. Now let me real quick before you ask this next question, uh, an all star. An all-star team of college players in basketball Ooh. against against your typical middle of the road NBA team. Middle of the road, I'm going to say no. Because when I think of like a middle of the road team, I think I think of like the Portland Trailblazers, for instance. They're middle of the road to me. They've got Damian Lillard who consistently drops 50, 60 a yeah. game. I don't think they have a shot. Bottom bottom tier, I do think a collegiate all-star team could could really put some pressure on a terrible yeah. NBA team. Some of those teams are tanking, so they really don't have much talent, to be honest. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's where your your least amount of disparity would would be would mm -hmm. be your would be pull, pulling together some college, you know, all stars in basketball. Mm -hmm. Yep, or even like a, a NCAA football, like an SEC all, all SEC team I, could probably put a real run on a I NFL can see, side. I, I I I tend to go back to basketball because. When you think about it, they're all running the same type of stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. in football, you have the quarterback who is an X factor, and you have to play from that quarterback position. So, you know, you know, this quarterback could favor this guy, and mm -hmm. could you know, bad bad matchups and whatnot. But this is a uh, this is totally a, a question that just came to my mind as we're talking about this hypothetically. Do you think any of the XFL teams could beat any? Of the NFL teams, because I would say no in that one as no, well. No, not a, not a chance. Okay, that it, it, it just popped in my head. I, I'm actually thinking that a college team could probably beat an XFL you know, team. Ooh, I like that as a question yeah. too. Okay, I'm going to make note of that. All right, yes. Dan, your next question. We're going to stay in the collegiate sports realm on this one. False. <laughs> Should college athletes be paid? Yes. Yes. Any yes. reason why? They are bringing so much money. Well, I can't say they as in a general term because not every sport that a sport athlete is bringing in money for their for their team. You know, I went and watched my my nephew Ryan a few weeks ago pitch for his his college, and there's n no attendance fee, so you mm -hmm. know, they're not getting paid. Do you think all collegiate athletes should get paid? I think I think anyone that is recognizable, anyone that gets talked about. Um, and that should that should be it there. If ESPN or Fox or any of these sports channels talks about this kid, this woman, this this male, whatever it is, they should get paid at that point. Yeah, I'm I'm on board. I'm actually I'd, I'd expound it even further. I think I think all collegiate athletes should get paid, but paid I think paid means something different to me than it means to. I'm not saying they should just cut a check. Can I, for, can I define mine? Yeah, sure. So paid to me for for a lot of these college athletes would just be um, not having to worry about food, not having to worry yes. about their dorm, not having to worry about paying for books, any of this kind of stuff. Yes, a lot of this is is under that scholarship. But think about um, you know go on the internet and and watch um, 
uh, NCAA football scholarship announcements hmm. where these teams get together and they will announce one player that got a scholarship and all 99 players from this team are just ecstatic to hear that this one kid finally got a scholarship. Hmm. You know, so I think any kid that – there should never be a college athlete that has to eat bologna and – bologna sandwiches or peanut butter and jelly. They should all be fed, you know, exactly what they need at all times. And they should, you know, I'm not saying that you give them 20000 to, uh, you know, go out there and make sure that his wardrobe is tip top mm -hmm. and on that, that kind of stuff. But, you know, make sure he's, he's well fed. Yeah, what drives me nuts is, you know, when sometimes you see these, you know, it comes out that a college had an infraction where they paid a guy, you know, and you find out it took him out to dinner or something. Yeah. Like, Get out of here with that stuff to me. You know, I don't – when you're paying coaches like Nick Saban and, and Mike Krzyzewski $10 million sometime a year, yeah. why can't, you know, why can't Trevor Lawrence, who's the QB at Clemson, who's the most recognizable person in the Clemson school program, why can't he make some money for doing it? And, you know, I, I, I especially think – these athletes should get paid when you're a sport like the NBA or the NFL, where you say these guys can't go directly from high school to the pros. You're you're putting exactly. in a system yeah. where, you know, LeBron, for instance, if this if the NBA system was in place today when LeBron James was coming out of high school, he would have had to be forced to play college ball. That's insane. Yes. That's absolutely insane. If a guy like LeBron James, and you know, I get it, he's a once in a lifetime athlete, but if these guys, Kobe Bryant and Kevin Garnett, two guys we talked about earlier, yeah. they both came straight out of high school, went to the NBA. If a guy has an opportunity and believes he's good enough to go straight there, he shouldn't be forced to go to college and not get paid for a couple of years because if he goes to college and tears his ACL or breaks his leg or, you know, any numerous number of things could happen to him, he doesn't get all that no. money to take care of. And what does his the college mom. do? College just puts them on a injured reserve, doesn't care about them, and they yep. stop. You know, yep. You know, yep. think think about how many football players were were prospects coming out of their high school and then um, got a knee injury, and you never hear about them again. Football's and, the one for me that I think they sh they they need to set up some sort of scale. I get that, like a a college, you know, a guy who was on the rowing team in college shouldn't be getting paid what the college you know, a D1 QB should be yeah, getting paid. Correct. But there should be some sort of scale to where they are all, they're all bringing revenue to their exactly. college. They're all increasing, you know, their college's brand in some yeah. fashion. They should all be included in the amount of – those colleges are getting a ton of money. The boosters are giving tons of money to the colleges. The TV rights that these schools are getting, it's insane. It's absolutely crazy. NCAA is making a ridiculous amount of money on these kids – Yes, they, they should all get paid to some degree. And there's, you know, we could go on about the varying degrees of that. But, yes, I agree. Pay them. Yeah, give, give them exactly. their money. They deserve it. You yep. know? That's why I'm watching the games. I'm not watching the games because of, you know, the, the coach or whatever. Exactly. And if you take somebody, um, you take, once again, you take um, um, LeBron and you put him on a college team for one year. You know, we had it with, um, let's see, not uh, – I'm trying to think of uh, – uh, Larry Hughes mm -hmm. for yep. for SLU. Yep. Larry Hughes came to SLU for one year. Whoop de do. You right. know who 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 cares? And you know sometimes another St. Louis connection. Uh, at the time when they didn't force you to go to college and you could just come out of high school, there was a kid from St. Louis, Darius Miles. Yeah, he yeah. was being kind of talked about as like the next. I think I think at that time everyone was being compared to Kobe, and everyone was like, "Who's going to be the next Kobe Bryant or whatever?" And a lot of people thought it'd be Darius Miles. And he thought he was good enough to go high school to pros. Turns out he wasn't. You know, he, he probably could have used the college. But that should be his decision to make. Yeah, you know? exactly. If he feels and believes in himself enough, he should have that opportunity. And ideally, he sets himself with a, the, a good group of people around him. He makes a decent amount of money, probably on a guaranteed contract. And then if, if things don't work out in the NBA later in his life, he has the money and the luxury to, to go to college and get it. Exactly. You know, yeah. like that, that's the thing. Had, had part of his thinking f been for college been, Oh, well, okay, well I'll get, I'll get a little bit money and maybe I can help, you know, help my family at home and spend a year or two developing my game, mm -hmm. you know, easily um, somebody's going to go, okay, well I will spend two years in college. Yep. You know, and not jump straight to the straight to the NBA or, or whatever. Yep, I'm with you. Okay, let's see here. 
Oh, this is a good one. Should coaches have to wear suits during the game like in NBA and NHL? I hate coaches in suits. Uh, we might disagree on this one. I, I've, I've, this is a great question. I'm glad whoever sent this in sent it in. I have been wondering for so many years why there's, a, there's like this strict dress code for, and maybe you can enlighten me. I'm thinking of the, the coach on the hockey bench who's in a full suit and tie. And, you know, like you said in the NBA, all the coaches, it's a mandate. You have to wear a suit and tie. And then I look at, like, who's the best coach in the NFL right now? Bill Belichick. Yeah. Dude dresses like he's homeless, okay? Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't change. No. He's still revered in the sport. Yeah. He's still – and then, you know, when I look at – the the club I support in England, Liverpool, they have Jurgen Klopp, who's I think the best manager in the world. Wearing he, sweats. He wears sweats and a tracksuit and yeah. you know, like a baseball cap and he's just a normal guy. He doesn't I, I don't I don't need my coach to be in a suit. I think that's ridiculous, you know. If and I always wonder that. I'm waiting for one of these days when, you know, an NBA guy or a, a hockey guy just shows up on the bench in a you know, I mean, what are they gonna do? Are they gonna find him? I don't really know. I don't know the the standards for you know what the repercussions are if you don't wear a suit, but I, I think it's ridiculous. I, I don't get it. Maybe please enlighten me if you know where the origin of that is. I you know I don't, um, but uh, a little bit of of it is um, you know they're coming from the business business side of things. So back in the day, you know yeah that that NH, NHL coach was in his office and he was working within the office. Mm -hmm. So so he's wearing a, a shirt and tie like everybody else in the in the 50s did and the same with the nba and you know the the only difference you know the difference that i see is is the mlb that has has their coaches in in the uniform <laughs> the uniform <laughs> which kind of is the total opposite of what you know what we think should be happening too um yeah you know back in the day who was the uh oh pete rose uh -huh. you know pete rose as a manager a player uh-huh yeah Put him in a uniform, right? But uh, but Tony Larusa does not need to be does not need to be in in full uniform, and, right? You know, and you know, I I sort of get it that you know they're they're part of the team, and you know they're they're showcasing this whole as this whole thing as a team, but at the same time, he's got his stirrups on, <laughs> he's got his he's got his baseball shoes on. <laughs> You know, um, you know, not all of them. A, a few yeah. of them, you know, have their have their regular sneakers on or whatever they want to wear. But I, I don't get that either. So <laughs> I'm gonna so, have to look up the origin of it because I have no idea why. They're, they're specifically the hockey and basketball are so strict. Exactly. You, you know? know, and and well, you know, and they're strict for their players too. Yeah. You know, so their players do show up in ties. Though to be fair, and you know this this might be a hot topic. You know, for people, I love. So the NBA has sort of a, a dress code now yeah, because yeah. there was a period of time where they thought their players kind of looked like thugs or however they wanted to describe them, where they would show up in, you know, whatever they wanted to wear. Pimpalicious outfits. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they'd have big gold chains and stuff. And, you know, that's what the, the way they want to dress. I don't care. But, you know, now they have a dress code and they show up in these ridiculous outfits now. Oh, that yeah. That adhere to the dress code. But they're so – they're like what you'd see on a fashion runway. They're oh, yeah. so outlandish. And I love it because I'm like – they're just they're just making a mockery of the dress code and kind of pointing out the the ridiculousness of it. And, yeah, and I'm on board with that. I think it's hilarious, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'd like to actually. I'd like to see because um you know I watch Inside Anfield with uh, the Liverpool team and they're usually coming from the training facility. So I'd like to see them going actually to the training facility. Are they in their regular? Every days, or are they dressed up before they get to? Oh, they're in the regulars. Yeah. They're okay. Oh yeah, they'll show up in sweatpants and things. Yeah. Okay. Would, okay. I, I don't. I don't have a problem if a coach wants to wear a suit. I think of a guy like Pat Riley. You know, yeah. Pat Riley liked to wear a suit. It gave you know he was he was uh, the coach of the Showtime Lakers, and he had this persona of being, you know, yeah, like, him Phil Jackson. You you yeah. can't picture Phil Jackson without a suit on. Exactly. And I again, if a guy wants to wear a suit, but I don't get the mandate for having to wear a suit. You know, especially. I, I think I got the guy in hockey. I don't think there is a mandate. I think in the NBA, it's really. I, I think, and I think hockey is the same way. Or else, I, you'd, somebody would break tradition. It's. It, the, I think both of those sports have 
defined rules that you have to wear huh, okay. full suit. Well, I'm, right. I'm going to research this before next week because I want to know more about this. But Comment below. Let us know. Yeah, please. I'm dying to hear, and I especially want to get people's opinion because I, I think it's silly. And <laughs> so so the down down to the very minimal of this, um, suits I don't think they should do. Um, the uniforms for the MLB need to go. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's over with. You know, throw in some slacks, throw in some jeans. You know, you can still wear your you can still wear your your jersey, but do something else. We don't want to see, you know, we don't want to see Lou Pinella <laughs> and his god awful legs in a baseball outfit. You know, or a uniform. Sorry, I yeah. didn't mean to say outfit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I think the I think the baseball managers wearing uniforms is worse than coaches wearing suits. Hundred percent. Yeah, you got a point there. Exactly, and you know, I, again, I you know, I mentioned my uh, my nephew. Who I went to go watch play. Um, the coaches looked ridiculous. <laughs> These college coaches look ridiculous. Yeah, I'm do. sorry, you you were nowhere near going to ever get on the field because you're a college coach, right? Put on put on something that's appropriate. All right, Dan. I know this one's going to be probably near and dear to your heart because you're a huge hockey fan. Yes, sir. So the question we've been posed is. The best captain in NHL history is blank. Best captain in NHL history, according to Dan. The best captain in NHL history. There's a lot of good ones that come to mind. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to throw out an honorable mention for the person that everybody is going to think is going to be my answer. And um, I'm going to say Wayne Gretzky oh, okay. as, a, as an honorable mention. Okay. Um, you know, I don't really know – Exactly, you know, this is a hard, this is such a hard question because all we're seeing as a captain is on ice, yeah, and what we don't see is off ice, and that's where I'm, you know, again as a as a hockey coach um, and a player, um, not a good player, but as a coach, um, you would notice that um, there were kids that were the C, but didn't step up as a C. Mm-hmm. Um, in the locker room and stuff, but on the ice, they're you know they're they're the ones talking to the ref. They're the ones who can control the conversation from the ref to me, and they do it you know outstanding. I had um, I had a couple kids that were just outstanding with it. Um, uh, I can't think of them now. I can't think of their names, um, but I'm gonna go with uh, Stevie Y, mm. just because I think. I think he just he just personified what you wanted your captain to sound like, what you wanted your captain to look like, mm-hmm. how you wanted him to you know to address uh, the media, all that kind of stuff. I I like Stevie Y, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that. Well, um, I'm gonna throw out a couple honorable mentions too that come to mind. Perfect, thank you. You mentioned Gretzky. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention his counterpart in Edmonton. That's Mark Messier. I think Mark Messier, uh, who had the C for a while, and then obviously he became most famous with the New York Rangers when he made the guarantee that they were going to win, and they ended up oh, winning. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's that story's become larger than life, to where, uh, you know, he made a guarantee. He, he, he just because he's the captain, he made made a guarantee. Did not therefore make them win the championship. Um, but I do think Mark Messier is yeah, an amazing captain. And the other one, this is a personal favorite. This is not going to be my answer. He's my favorite hockey player of all time, Joe Sackick. I love Joe Sackick. Oh. At, when I played hockey you know, growing up, I always modeled my game after Joe Sackick because he was, the, he was usually the quietest guy in the room. And when you looked at Joe Sackick, he's a very unassuming-looking guy. And – Early on when he was with Quebec when they were the Nordiques and then early when they went to Colorado before they started winning cups, people used to criticize Joe Sackick and say he wasn't a good captain because he wasn't vocal and he wasn't this loud, boisterous guy. Yeah. And then over the years, I think people realized there was this quiet calm about Joe Sackick and he set he set an example. And it's I feel like Alex Petrangelo is in the Joe Sackick model of he's a guy who doesn't have to be the loudest. He doesn't have to – command a room with his voice he commands it with his presence and his, yeah. his work ethic and his attitude and his determination and so i think joe sackick for me was the player i most aspired to be growing up but it pains me to say this i agree with you steve eiserman 
<laughs> best captain in NHL history. And That's he, funny. And he's a he's a Detroit Red Wing, which makes my blood boil. <laughs> How do we both go to Stevie Y? You know, I think it's just the fact that you know he was the captain there for going on twenty years. I think he was he was with the Red Wings for twenty three years in total. He to me he he personified. Uh, I think one of the things that makes a great captain any sport, uh, but it's it's amplified in hockey because he's actually wearing the C. Is I think it's harder to be a captain in a locker room full of huge egos, and I think that's what made Steve Eiserman to me the captain of captains. When you look at a lot of those Red Wings teams, it's a it's literally a Hall of Famer at every position. Oh, yeah. You know Shanahan and Chelios and Hull and Fedorov and on and on and on and yeah. on and and Steve Eiserman always controlled the room. Oh yeah, you know, and I think oftentimes another. Another way you judge a captain is just the person that follows him. Um, and so who followed Steve Eiserman? Nick Lidstrom. Yeah. I would put Nick Lidstrom in the category of greatest captain of all time. He's on that list for me. And it's because he learned day in and day out by, from Steve Eiserman how you become a great oh, captain. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Steve Eiserman for me. Oh, but he's a Red Wing, so I, I hate saying that. Hey, yeah. I, you know, at, at this point, you know, as long as they're not on the current rosters of these teams, it's all fair. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you, you have to respect. Oh, you have to respect the greatness that has has been on other teams all these years. Yes, there was there was a there was a there was a respect and hatred to the Red Wings growing up for me, and as a Blues fan, they just broke our heart time and time again. But I, I never I never hated Steve Eiserman the person. There were certain hockey players where I just found them to be really repulsive characters and people. But Steve Eiserman, I always felt, did it the right way. So, so yeah, once again, the, the St. Louis Blues had the Chicago Blackhawks and the Detroit Red Wings as our rivals. Mm -hmm. The Chicago Blackhawks were our rivals. For four or five years there, St. Louis Blues fans feared, feared Detroit. That's the, yes. There, there was not one time you see them on the schedule and you're like, ah, oh, we got this game. And we, no. were, and we were not, we... We felt that they were our rivals. They did not look at St. Louis at that time as rivalry. They looked no. at Colorado and some other powerhouse yeah. teams. Yes. Every time I saw the Red Wings, we, we, you we, knew we, the, the game was over when they arrived in town or when we were, you yeah. know. Yeah. The, there was an aura around the Red Wings that I don't think has been seen in hockey since. And it, I think Steve Eiserman set the tone. So, yeah. You think of, you think of Red Wings hockey – Against the Blues, and you think of Stevie Y, and what's the only thing you think of? That shot from the, the shot. Oh my from God, the, from the red line. Yeah, that. Yeah, it's 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 infamous around here in town, but I don't think anyone in St. Louis can slander Steve Eiserman as no. a hockey player. He's unbelievable. So so uh, you know a little bit a little bit off the subject a little bit on the subject. Um, props to the teams that do have, you know, like two captains, and maybe an assistant. Mm -hmm. Um. But uh, but the teams that throw out six seven captains these high school teams are you know I, I'm shaking my head um, I apologize to my nephew but but there was uh, there was six captains and like five four or five assistant captains on his on the state winning team hmm. that's uh, that's a coach who who doesn't have the balls to pick a captain yeah um, so that 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 one goes out to um, uh, I can't think of it's McGlynn or Brian McGlynn or whatever your name is that that was the coach for Viani. Um, step up, choose one, choose two. Don't choose six or seven guys because they're all seniors. Mm -hmm. You know these 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 kids are looking around the locker room, going, they know who the captain is, right? You know, and, and just because six of them have a C on their chest doesn't mean you know. It's one thing to do it in like the final game of the season or something as an honorary. Yeah, mark it, or yeah, whatever. That's but fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? What I saw, and uh, what I saw because of that, was that the rest of the team would chirp to the refs. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them would chirp to the refs because they were, the refs were looking around, going, "Well, which one of the six captains should I listen to, or should I listen to this uh, chump sixty-one here?" And chump sixty-one was always yapping his mouth. So you know, it's like, shut up, chump sixty-one. <laughs> All right, Dan. We got two final questions in the mailbag this week. On to you. What do you got? Okay. All right. Do you put more weight on advanced stats or the old-fashioned eye tests? That's a wonderful question. I uh, I can picture Stuart 
who's one of our podcast crew members yes. in my head. He's an advanced stat guru, and I love to rib him for uh, his advanced stat knowledge and war, specifically in baseball. I'm, I'm a stat junkie, too. I'll admit it. I, I love digging into stats and you know getting into all the minutia of things and, and playing with different permutations. I, I, have, I have fun with stats. I think stats are a lot of fun. Yeah. And I think... I think hard real stats, you know, what do you define by real, I guess, is another question. But I think I think hard stats mean a lot to me, but I put far more weight on the eye test for me. Uh, oh, yeah. I think I think I can see just because you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use basketball because it's a sport I follow a lot and uh, an example comes to mind, James Harden. He's leading the league this year in, in points per game, you know, 30-plus a game. He's – Definitely one of the best players in the NBA. He can score at will. However, the eye test tells me he's selfish. He doesn't play defense. He, The game doesn't play around him. He's not a team player. He likes to dribble up and just play isolation ball, and he'll score a lot. However, when, when the game gets tough, a lot of times if his shot's not hitting and he gets cold, he doesn't know how to facilitate, and he doesn't play well. So... The advanced stats will tell you James Harden's one of the best players of the generation. Yeah. But the eye test tells me he's not in the conversation for best players in basketball because what is he doing to make his team better? How's, how many times has he made the finals? How many championships has he won? For me, that's what matters is, oh, yeah. you know, what do I see with my eyes? And, and so, yeah, I, we, can, we can play with advanced stats all day, but my eyes are telling me the truth in most cases, I think. I don't know about you. You know, the, the really the only time that I really look at any type of stats is, is with baseball. Um, all the rest of these stats are just kind of ebb and flow, um, like you said with Harden or with some of these other guys. They could have a they could have a monster game, and then the next game they could have a uh, you know a shutdown game. Um, but you know the only real true test is 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 the uh, batting average in in baseball or the mm -hmm. ERA in baseball. You know these are true these are true numbers that. You're expecting, you know, this player to live up to based on these numbers. You know, yeah, baseball. You know, these, you know, somebody coming in with a with a 200 average could could easily hit four for four in a game and you know boost up their average. But you know, it's it's the only one that's that's showing sort of, you know, as, as close as possible to what we the stats are going to say is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, other other stats don't really, you know, I don't really care to watch, or nor do I usually know them half the time. Yep, I'm with you on that. All right, it's our final question of the week. Okay, we're going back to basketball again, Dan. All right. So, legendary head coach Phil Jackson. Oh yeah. Is he underrated or overrated? Well, I think he's rated just just perfectly, he, actually. Okay. I mean, um, I don't know how he can be. I don't know how he could be underrated when he's won nine times. Nine times, and I don't know how he can be overrated when he's won nine times. So I think the origin of this question is a lot of people in the basketball community think he's overrated. And the reason most people who are on the side of is he overrated think he won nine championships, yes. Yes. But he coached. Jordan in his prime for six of them. Yeah. And he won three of them with Shaq and Kobe. Yeah. No, he has 11 championships. He has 11? Correct me. Okay. Yeah, he won five in L.A. Uh, he has 11 titles. So he has six with Jordan and the Bulls. He has three with Shaq and Kobe, and then he won two more with Kobe and Pau Gasol in that group. So a lot of people say he's overrated because he had the luxury of having Jordan, Shaq, Kobe. So, so that's that's why some people think – so I mean, are we thinking that Belichick is is a overrated coach too? Because um, let's yeah, we'll throw Belichick. It's, you know, let's let's just stop going down that road. Um, but I mean, you still have to take these. You still have to take these personalities, especially on a on a, a game like NB, the NBA. There's five guys you can have on the on the on the court. Mm -hmm. That tells me that you need to balance seven, eight nine guys to get the perfect amount of time from every single one of them. And, um, you know, I, I can't say that I've ever seen a time where, um, where he pulled Scotty or Kobe 
or Shaq or Jordan off the off the court, and they basically w- like would wave them off or something. Mm-hmm. There's I don't think I've ever seen that. So if they believe in you know a, okay maybe I should take a rest for you know for however long he thinks I should. Um, you know they they have faith in them, so I'm going to have faith in them. So let me clarify: I most definitely fall on the underrated side. When I was talking about those people who are on the overrated side, that's not me. I think he's slightly underrated, close to where you think, right? As an accurate rating, how many titles did Jordan win before Phil Jackson? Zero. Yeah. How many did he win after Phil Jackson? Zero. Obviously, he only played yeah. Washington afterwards. How many titles did Shaq and Kobe win before Phil Jackson? Zero. How many did they, did, they, did they win? You know how you know like the his nickname was the Zen Master, and that's a very fitting nickname. And on April nineteenth, when this Jordan documentary comes out, I imagine there's going to be a lot of stuff on oh, Phil sure. Jackson shown. And it goes back to what I was mentioning about Steve Eiserman in the previous question. I think there's an art to managing egos, and yeah. in basketball specifically, because there's only five guys on the court at any given time. The players have more weight on what happens in the game. I feel like tactics tactics are less in basketball, you know, like the, the coach isn't his the tactics are less important than his man management. In basketball, I want a coach who knows how to manage egos, manage minutes, manage situations. Ego, egos is the big thing. It's all about I'm egos. Out of that. Yeah. yeah. And you know, Phil also created or he didn't really create it, but he he perfected it and, and made it big. The triangle offense, which if you're a fan of basketball, is a, is a type of offense that, you know, Phil sort of made great. Too with, low, one high? Yeah. Yep. And so so the triangle offense was all about, you know, what it says. It's a, it's a triangle of, of – you. it's all about being positioned in a triangle and creating these triangles to pass in and out of, you know, possession. And Jordan was amazing at it. Kobe was amazing at it. Shaq was amazing at it. Like – these players played better when they played in Phil Jackson's triangle offense. So he had like the foundation of the offense. Then he let the guys go out and play. But then it was really when, when they're in the locker room, you know, and especially yeah. with Shaq and Kobe, those guys did not get along towards the end. They both wanted to be the alpha dog and Phil had to manage that situation. And then even when Shaq leaves, he's got Kobe who doesn't have, you know, his sidekick. And then they still win two more titles with, they bring in Paul Gasol and they sort of reshape the thing. For me, those two titles after Shaq left are really what defined Phil Jackson, the coach. Because that was the first time, you know, he had Jordan and Pippen. He had Shaq and Kobe. Then he had Kobe with a bunch of other pieces. And he had to he had to make Pau Gasol the number two. And he had to, you know, create he had, that he had team. Ego, yeah, ego Kobe. Yes. And so, and, you know, I, yeah, I think Phil is definitely in the pantheon of greatest coaches in sports of all time, so I'm so I'm guessing uh, you know once again I'm not the biggest NBA guy. Um, I'm guessing that the overrated comes from when he took over the Knicks and yeah. the Knicks were just I mean uh-huh. was a disgrace when he took them over and they just really didn't go anywhere. Yeah, and you know again some people just think he got lucky that he showed up in Chicago at the time when Jordan was hitting his absolute prime, and he got lucky that Shaq and Kobe, you know, were both hungry for championships. I. But again, luck's going to always play a hand in exactly. Things. But again, you take that, um, you take those early '90 teams with the Chicago Bulls, and look at some of the guys that were that were thrown out on the on the court. You know, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't always it wasn't always Michael and Scotty and Kerr. Mm-hmm. You know, there was there was so many so many guys that that would come in and out, and he utilized most of his bench at that time. It's when you look at like. Uh, he had Horace Grant and John Paxson, fine, fine basketball players, but those guys are not winning championships on most teams. Or no, but he, but I'm sure he he looked at them straight in the eye and said, "You do what I tell you to do. Yeah, what I suggest you do, and we're going to win this championship." And they did. I yeah. mean, this, he he always had them prepared for whatever situation they were going to be in. John Paxson hit a huge shot to basically seal one of the early. Or early championships, and then later in the second three peat, Steve Kerr hit a massive shot, and Jordan kicked the ball out to him. He always had his players prepared for any given moment. Yeah, and I think that's important. So that will do it for our mailbag of questions. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to announce the greatest athlete of all time tournament winner. I, I would have to say that um, I would put Jackie Moon 
up with Phil Jackson. <laughs> Sorry, just watch that this weekend again. This oh, did you? Great, great movie. Great okay, movie. we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Sorry. <laughs> so, Dan, I must admit, as I was driving into work today, it was like a ghost town out there in the parking lot. I think everybody's freaking out about this coronavirus, Andrew. It sure feels like it. I know it's got the whole country on lockdown right about now. Don't worry, though. Dan and I are here with four essential tips to help talk you through the virus. Number one, let's wash those hands, people. I always tell my son, sing the alphabet song while you're washing to get a good thorough clean. Andrew, I've been skipping handshakes. Um, I, I know I look a little rude, but that's it has to be done right now. Yeah, and third, keep a safe distance. Dan and I have six feet between us right now, which is recommended. And lastly, stay home. All right, welcome back, everybody. We've been running a tournament on the STL Break Twitter page. Be sure to follow us if you don't already. Over the last month, we've uh, taken a lot of fan votes, and we've determined the greatest athlete of all time. So we got down to the final matchup. It came down to Michael Jordan and Michael Phelps, no surprise, two heavyweights of the athletes of all time. Dan, before I reveal the winner, which one do you think probably won? Um, I'm going to shake my head if people said Michael Phelps. Because MJ is just MJ. I mean, once again, people know people know him as his number, as MJ, as Michael, as Jordan. His airness. His airness. Yeah. His label. I mean, yeah, just too recognizable. Yeah, and there's, there's kind of been a Jordan theme throughout this episode, which I didn't really think about. But, uh, yeah, so to no surprise, 77.8% of the vote goes to the winner of yeah. the greatest athlete of all time, as voted by you, the fans, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. So I am in agreement Michael Jordan should have won the tournament. But I do have a bone to pick with fans, not necessarily our fans on the STL break page, but fans in general who were voting on ESPN this last week. So I don't oh, know okay. if you caught it. ESPN was running a tournament similar, similar to what similar. we were doing. Okay, It was greatest college basketball player of all time. Oh, okay. Michael Jordan in a landslide one greatest college basketball player of all time. He beat Larry Bird in the final. I would make the case that, number one, Jordan shouldn't have been in the final. No. He certainly shouldn't have beat Larry Bird, who was a much better collegiate player. Yeah. I'm going to throw a name out that I think when I say the name, everyone should say, of course he was the best college basketball player of all time. It predates me, but I'm not a dummy to history. Lou Alcindor, oh, as yeah. we all know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, just listen. Here's Kareem's college numbers, okay? They're crazy. He played three years, averaged 26.4 points per game at the college level. He won three titles. He was named College Player of the Year three times, Final Four Player of the, player of the Tournament three times, and he finished with an 88-2 and two record over his three years in college. So no offense to Jordan. Jordan averaged 17.7, played three years, won one title, won one Player of the Year, there's no comparison. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, no. a.k.a. Lou Alcindor at the time, was, will, will forever be the greatest collegiate basketball player that has ever lived. Yeah, I, uh, I did I did see something about uh, Jordan being the, the greatest uh, collegiate athlete. I didn't realize that it was an ESPN poll. And he, like, he beat uh, Larry Bird by, like, I think the, he had like 65 or 70% of the vote in that final. That's that's people who remember him as a, as a pro only. Um, he, yes, and they, I think they forget that when he played at North Carolina, while he was a really good player, I don't think he was the best player on his team. No. He played with one James Worthy, who obviously James Worthy went and played with the Lakers and Kareem and Magic and won there. But James Worthy coming out of college was unstoppable. He was yeah. the number one. Jordan wasn't even the number one overall pick in the draft. That's kind of all you have to say about yeah, like exactly. Jordan, Jordan was rated highly coming out of college, but he wasn't considered a consensus number one pick. You know, Hakeem Olajuwon got picked first overall in that draft, not Michael Jordan. You know, James Worthy was a first overall pick because people thought James Worthy was yeah. the best player. So, yeah, it, uh, it, uh, craziness. it surprised me. Okay, so we got that greatest athlete of all time bracket out of the way. We appreciate all the votes again. So we've got a new one coming up that will start actually on Thursday. Dan, you and I have the bracket in front of us. We're just going to kind of quickly run through this. It's the greatest sports video game of all time. So we did a little bit of research and – to come up with the bracket. And so what we've done is we've broken it up into four quadrants. We've got eight video games in the 1970s and 1980s bracket. We've yep. got eight video games in the 1990s bracket. All right. We've got eight video games in the 2000 through 2004 bracket. That was considered the golden era of sports video games. Oh, yeah. And definitely. then we've got eight more games, 2005 to present. 
So really quickly, I'm just going to run down the one seeds of the four brackets so you kind of have an idea of who the early favorites are. In the 1970s and 80s, you have Pong. Played it in the 1970s, by the way. You did? Okay. I did play that. So that was sort of the, the first sports video game, if you will. Then in the 1990s, NHL 94. Had it. Played it. Yep. So that, that's our one seed in the 90s. When you go to 2000 to 2004, again, this is the golden era of sports video games as considered by most people. You've got Madden 2004. For those of you that uh, don't remember which Madden that was, that's the Michael Vick cover. Michael Vick was an unstoppable freight train in oh, yeah. 2004. I had it. And then 2005 through present is NBA 2K11 with our one seed. That was uh, – Michael Jordan was actually on the cover that year, and they uh, had an entire – an entire storyline where you played as Jordan through all of his greatest moments. Oh, okay. And, uh, I had that one, and that game deserves the one seed. So really quickly, Dan, we're looking at these 32 sports video games. I'm not going to ask you to break them down. We'll have all the matchups up on Twitter. Are there any that stand out to you, games in specific, that just have a near and dear place to your heart as you look over this list? Well, anybody growing up in the 90s is going to look at Tecmo Bowl. Oh yeah, and uh, and first thing you first thing you say when you say Tecmo Bowl is no, you can't play with the Raiders. <laughs> the the Raiders are <laughs> they're off limits. <laughs> they're off limits. Um, another one, uh, another couple that I see here is uh, Tony Tony Hawk Pro Skater. I knew you were going to say Tony Hawk. I knew I, I love that game, man. It was just so, so good. Um, Got to love Punch Out. Yep. Um, let's see here. What else we got here? We have. Uh, I mean, these two thousand to two thousand four. That almost uh, almost came a time where um, where sports uh, sports games weren't the greatest. Um, well, I'm sorry, weren't the greatest games out there. Um, there was a lot of good sports games, but that's a that's a, a big time where you know these other type of games were popping up, and you know so um, so that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough one in this uh, this 2004 to present. Um, most of these I haven't played um, just because I've kind of aged out. Um, <laughs> Sounds sounds pretty pretty bad, but uh, yeah, most you know. So I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a lot of weight to the left side of the bracket, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. That's kind of your wheelhouse, right that's, there. That's that's my wheelhouse, you know. And once again, I'm just telling everybody how old I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna point out a couple really quickly that yes, I please. so I'm a I'm a kid that grew up in the the 90s really. So the 90s kind of stood out to me. NBA Jam was my jam. Big heads, right? That was a big head. Big game. heads. Uh, he's on fire. Boom shakalaka. Oh yeah, yeah. Tons of good stuff from NBA Jam. That's a two on two, right? Two, two on two. two. Yep. Uh, and then Super Mario Kart. We can define if that was a sports video game. I think it was. I think so. But I, I the the original Super Mario Kart on Super Nintendo, classic. Uh, as I looked at 2000 through 2004, I'm definitely going to agree that Madden 04 with Michael Vick sort of. In your era of Tecmo Bowl, where people were like, you can't play as the Raiders, you can't be Bo Jackson, it was that same philosophy for Madden 04. So I would play a lot of Madden tournaments at college and things like that, and people were always like, you can't be the Falcons, because Michael Vick, oh, he, he, yeah. was like, he was like 99 speed, had the best throwing arm. Uh, he was unstoppable, and so you <laughs> had him. And then when I look at 2005 through present, I'm a big golf fan, and Tiger Woods PGA 12, that was the first year that you could play – uh, on the Masters in Augusta, oh, okay. that was why it got uh, okay. on the list. I love those Tiger Woods games. I miss I miss the Tiger Woods series. I always had fun with those. So for anybody that uh, wants to participate and get your votes for the sports video game bracket, you'll find those on our STL Break Twitter page. So please go over there and follow that. Yeah, follow, vote, and always comment. Comment if there was a if we if we're missing something. Yes, please. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. We hope you tell all your friends if you like what you heard. We hope you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an episode. And Dan and I, we're just going to keep our fingers crossed that hopefully things calm down and we can get back to normal. If they don't, we're just going to kind of keep doing these quarantine specials to pass yeah. the time. Yeah. Wash your hands. Keep your distance. That's right. All right, Dan. It's been a good time. And, Andrew, uh, it's nice talking to you. See you again next week. Sounds good.